The progress of the federal troops towards Asaba could be measured by the approaching sound of heavy guns and the rattling machine gunfire. Eyewitness account described 24 hours of ferocious shelling during which Asaba suffered its first casualties. Then the massacre followed. This video is inspired by the book entitled The Asaba Massacre, Trauma, Memory and the Nigerian Civil War written by Elizabeth Baird and Fraser Otanelli. Welcome to Hispo Media. Approaching Asaba from along the Opanam Asaba Road, federal troops reached the outskirts of town on October 4th where they overcame some Biafran resistance before occupying the grounds of St. Patrick's College later that day. This was the 2nd Division of the Nigerian Army led by Colonel Moritela Mohammed and Major Ibrahim Taiwo. At this point, many of the residents had fled into the nearby bush. Hundreds of people, including some who had first fled to the bush, men, women and children, gathered at the square wearing white attires signifying surrender and singing One Nigeria and also some bearing gifts for the soldiers. Since there was a lot of anxiety, some refused to take part. Both traditional criers using guns and trucks equipped with loudspeakers were reportedly calling on everyone to join. The chief information officer from Benin City, an Asaba man named Frederick Kongwe, was aboard one of these vans. Since he was well known, the sight of him allayed the fears of many residents who then came out in their numbers. Others were ordered to take part after being pulled from their homes by soldiers. Celestina Isiche was a college student who returned home to Asaba at the instance of northern pogrom and the threat of war. Her father resided on one of Asaba's most beautiful estates at the time, which was made of a large brick house and a number of outbuildings. The family, which consisted of her parents, younger brother Osi, sisters, and an older brother Emmanuel, together with his wife and little child, had felt generally secured back in their home. Her father was a powerful man and the family had recently celebrated her brother Patrick's ordination as a Catholic priest. They were now hiding as shots started to hit their house. Osi and his friend Callistus, both students of St. Patrick's College, hide under beds. However, when the soldiers arrived at their compound, all hell broke loose. Osi and his friend ran out of hiding and were accused of being Biafran soldiers. They were shot one after the other as they approached a gathering of women who were on a forced dance outside the gates of the compound. About 4,000 residents took part and were led by elders from the community. Groups emerging from homes in the five Asaba quarters joined those who had congregated by a big tree on the Indebisi Road across from the High Court. St. Patrick's College student Christopher Mpaya, who had already witnessed a friend from school die, was waiting anxiously in his home. After some time, the crowd at Ndebisi Road started dancing and singing One Nigeria, One Nigeria, One Nigeria. Along the major Ndebisi Road, the crowd passed the Catholic Church of St. Joseph. Any hope that this act of kindness would calm the troops was immediately dashed. As Mpaya narrated, Federal forces flanked the marchers to prevent them from escaping, and other witnesses claimed they would also select men at random and have them killed in front of the crowd, as they did with Osi Isiche and his friend Kalistus. Once the crowd reached the corner of Ogbogonogo and Obeke markets, troops separated out women and small children, many of whom were carried into the maternity hospital on Inebisi Road while the men and boys of around 12 years and above were channeled between two rows of soldiers down the side road that led to the square at Ogweosoa, a village in the Asaba quarter of Ubomanta. Eyewitness narrate how Paul Ogwebo, a federal soldier, tried to intervene. He said, I was coming on my jeep and I saw a boy being taken away to be shot and the mother held him by the waist and then I came out and asked for this nonsense to be stopped. And when they refused, I cocked my gun, said, Don't do it, or I will kill you. I managed to save some lives there. However, things were now out of control. Obebo reported that he left the scene to join his own troops who were camped on the outskirts of town. At this point, witnesses describe how mothers were attempting to protect their young sons by wearing them skates and gloves so that they could look like girls. Their effort yielded little or no result 
as the men and boys were led away to the open field nearby. Here, one account reported that the federal troops divided the men into groups of 10 and shot them. Apparently, tired of killing their victims this way, they readied a truck-mounted machine gun and started shooting at the crowd of men. One survivor narrates as follows. When we got there, they said we should now stop. As we stopped there, they now surrounded us, sat us down, they start whipping us. The next thing we saw, the officer spoke in Hausa. I was born in the north, so I heard what he said. He said, they should take us 10 by 10 and start firing us. I said, we are finished. Some people say they are just trying to threaten us. That officer now picked out somebody from the meat, shot him, picked out another, shot him. Then people were praying, Father forgive them, they don't know what they did. Another witness narrates as follows. 20 of our men were selected and lined up in front of us and told as follows. Today, I be your God, me first, God second, God gave you life, me, I go take him. Two minutes time, you go die. Two minutes afterwards, these 20 men were shot. Another 20 were picked up and the same ritual followed. 15-year-old Ifi Urea, who had joined the parade with his father and three elder brothers, Paul, Emmanuel, and Medua, described what happened. Some people broke loose and tried to run away. My brother was holding me by the hand. He released me and pushed me further into the crowd. They shot my brother in the back. He fell down and I saw blood coming out of his body. And then the rest of us just fell down on top of each other. And they continued shooting and shooting and shooting. I don't know how long it took. After some time, there was silence. I stood up. My body was covered in blood, but I knew that I was safe. My father was lying not far away. His eyes were open, but he was dead. Exactly how many died in this single incident is unclear. Around 700 to 800 seems likely, in addition to many who had died in the previous days. Sporadic shooting continued for hours until darkness caused the soldiers to disperse. Survivors, including Ifi Uria, lay still under the heap of bodies for a long time before feeling it was safe to wriggle out and run into the nearby bush. Ifi Uria and his cousin could later run to their grandmother's house where they found his sisters and three younger brothers. He told them their father and three older brothers were dead. Later, he learned that Medua had survived, gravely wounded, and had been carried to the bush by his friend. Community elders Michael Ugo and Leo Okogu were among a large number of the leading age grades to die. With all the men either dead or in hiding, it was left to women and children to attempt to retrieve the bodies of their fathers, brothers, husbands, and other relatives, and then drag them back to their compounds for burial. Joseph Unwaje, the boy who had returned with family from Ibadan, had escaped into the bush from the family compound after watching the earlier execution of his uncle, George, a prominent civil servant. When he returned a few days later, he learned of the death of his two brothers, aged 12 and 17, in the mass shooting. He narrates as follows. Mom told me that in the evening hours of the 7th of October, she had to go and look for their corpses at the mass place where they were shot. Most victims, however, were dumped in mass graves or thrown into the Niger River. Few people had any opportunity to conduct requisite burial practices and affronts that these deeply resented to this day. When it was safe to move about, Frank E.J., a local Red Cross worker, enlisted surviving men to dig horrid, shallow graves wherever they found bodies around the town. Esther Nwanze recalled her wives went searching for their husbands dragging them home if they could find them. Some dragged two days before they reached their homes. As more people began to trickle back into town, it became urgent to dig mass graves for the many unclaimed bodies. Who oversaw the massacre at Asaba? At the Justice Oputa panel that heard testimonies about brutalities against different groups and marginalization of different sections of the country, General IBM Haruna retired claimed that he ordered the massacre and had no apology. I, as a combatant commander of the troops, as a witness in this box, as a witness in this box, testifying for and on behalf of the soldiers who fought the civil war, they fought it in the principle of preserving the Nigerian Federation. I have no apologies 
for maintaining the Federation of Nigeria. That was my task. If my Commander-in-Chief, who was in command, gave me command, which I carried out with troops, if he now feels to apologize, and he has apologized, it is in his own wisdom to do so. However, some historians contended that Haruna was not in Asaba in 1967. They argued that he took over from Moritela Mohammed as the commanding officer of the 2nd Division in 1968. But why was Asaba the target of the federal troops and particularly Colonel Moritela Mohammed or even IBM Haruna? Asaba is the metropolis where soldiers like Major Kaduna Nziogu, the leader of Nigeria's first military coup on January 15, 1966, came from. Even though Nziogu was born and raised in the north, his parents were from Okpanam, 9 kilometers from Asaba. Okpanam fell within the Asaba metropolis or division as it was known then. Analysts adduce that Moritala Mohammed and Taiwo were not satisfied with their revenge coup of July 1966 where they killed Igbo officers as revenge for the January 1966 coup. Remember that Ziogu had led the coup in which the premier of the northern region, Amadou Bello, beloved by many in the north, was killed along with other northern leaders. Moritala and Taiwo were hell-bent on continuing their revenge killings beyond their fellow soldiers. This could have been the reason behind the massacre at Asaba. Click the video here for more on the battles to reclaim the Midwest and to capture Insuka. Remember to smash the like button on this video. Subscribe to Hispo Media if you have not done so. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next video. Peace.